opportunity to mark this year's Open Access Week in such a grand style. So Dr. Vanant, you're welcome. I also have with me Dr. Ranjana Bhattajuri. Dr. Ranjana is a molecular geneticist from the head IT headquarters here in Nevada. She's uh, a senior breeder as well, working in IIT Nigeria for the past 12 years, and she focuses on uh, genetic improvement of yams and cacao. Her experience encompasses conventional plant breeding and a wide range of state-of-the-art state of molecular biology techniques. Dr. Anjana immensely enjoys working in developing countries or regions with multiple challenges, and this has given her the enthusiasm to aim towards research needs that can impact any crop imp improvement program. Dr. Anjana, you're welcome. Also with me, we have Dr. Kagele Maso, a soil scientist and the IIT Cameroon country representative. Dr. Maso's scientific publications and policy advocacy are mainly in the field of soil fertility, soil improvement, nutrient management, biofertilizer quality, and sustainable agriculture intensification. Dr. Maso Kagele has since 2018 been coordinating the East Africa demonstration site of the International Nitrogen Management System, INMS, and is also the Executive Secretary since 2016 of the Africa Soil, Society, Soil Science Society. He is involved in cocoa soils since 2018. Dr. Masaka Gele is currently coordinating the Enable Youth Program in Cameroon as well. Dr. Maso, you're welcome. Dr. Maso also will be kind enough to address our French speaking audience this afternoon to create diversity in our, in, our, in our program. So Dr. Maso, you're welcome. I also have with me Mr. Bosun Obuleye, the Institutional Data Manager for IITA. Bosun will be discussing and sharing with us with his wealth, from his wealth of experience. Bosun is a versatile data manager and a data scientist, and I'm sure we will have an interesting presentation from him. And finally, I'm Olaya Emilua Shoga, the Open Access Open Data Administrator for IITA, and I'll be moderating this webinar this afternoon. So for each of our speakers, you have five minutes for your presentation, please. And let me remind our audience that this webinar is being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. So if you want to tune in, you can tune in to watch as well on Facebook and on YouTube. So without wasting much of our time, because we understand the different um, time zones where we are all watching from, I would like to invite Dr. Bernard Van Loy for his presentation. Over to you, yeah, sir. Thanks, thanks so lot, Amy. I will share slides. Hopefully this will work smoothly. Uh, you should be able to see the first slide that matters. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, very good. So thanks. Um, I was asked by Bosun to give a few introductory remarks. Um, I've given a few introductory remarks. I think it was on Wednesday, I believe, or Tuesday already. So I've repeated some of the statements I made in this slide, but I will not read all of them because I want to respect the, the time allocated for this discussion. So, um, you know, I talked... The last time I talked in, in the video footage, I talked about why open access. Um, there were six bullets mentioned. They are here again. Um, and then when you see all these good reasons to have open access, to engage with open access, then the question I'm asking myself is, why are we not supporting open access processes sufficiently? And I think that's one question we need to ask ourselves also, Boson, to move forward. What is stopping colleagues from engaging with open access? Um, I will not read those reasons. They are all here. I'm sure the slides will be available. But in summary, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense in terms of our own personal research results. It makes sense at the institutional level. Funder confidence was mentioned. And it makes sense at the partnership level because we need to work with others and others can only know our research work if they have access to it. 
And especially important is the sixth point that makes research in Africa more accessible and visible, which is really, really something we should absolutely support. So that's a question I'm asking myself. What I learned is that open knowledge is a combination of inside and open data. Boson explained this to me very well. Uh, we have focused a lot on open data in uh, recent years on the left side, the left part of the circle. If you apply science insights to open data, you create open knowledge. And, and all this feature under the heading of open access. We know that data in itself is something that scientists like to work with, but the access of information and knowledge and learning from those data is what matters to the other people, to, the, to our partners, to the clients, to the farmers that we are working with. This is a recent example which would not have been possible without open access. A lot of you have seen this paper, I guess. It's in Nature Food. It's a paper on fertilizer and grain prices and how it affects uh, yield gaps in Africa. Uh, what I learned, I've been quite a long time in the area of soil fertility management, but what I've learned from this paper is that the economic yield gap is actually only 25% of the actual ecological yield gap. For me, a very new insight. Uh, of course, we knew that economics of production is very important. But this is, a, this is a message that this story is telling us. And this story could only have been formulated because of the Guardian data infrastructure, which allowed to assemble over 10,000 response trials and price data. We also produced some nice maps covering the whole continent. So if you read that paper, if you're interested, read it. But the, the story and the message I'm trying to, to give is without big data, without open data, without infrastructure to manage open data, this paper would not have existed and the insights would not have been available to us. Just one example, I'm sure there's many more examples. What Boson also was telling me that structural equity refers to the fact that all participants, all stakeholders should participate equally in all open knowledge science products from developing countries, from developed countries, regardless of where you are, what you are, which career stage you're in, which discipline, which income or gender you have. So it's really about in ensuring that the diversity of people, the diversity of opinions, the diversity of clients all have equal participation in the generation and the accessing of, of uh, knowledge products, open knowledge products. I think in IT we are trying to work along those lines. Uh, we know there's quite a number of projects investing in ensuring that knowledge generated is accessible to third parties. I've given some examples, but there's many more. Uh, we know that it's spending a lot, for, lot of effort on them. There's the ProPass platform. Akai is working on Akilimo. There's the Six Steps logic for cassava wheat management. There's many, many others. So in IT, I think we are already investing quite a bit of time and effort via our P4D initiatives to be sure that we build structure equity at IAT and, and with IAT as partners. Secondly, we also know that quite a number of, of projects are explicitly focusing on gender and youth responsiveness, uh, recognizing that access to knowledge is of not gender and youth neutral. And thirdly, of course, a lot of the youth engagement projects are very good examples on how they facilitate access of research and open knowledge by future farmers. So we are, we are doing, working in, in the direction of structural equity. Uh, we can always do more, but it's good to learn on those examples and, and advance based on, on those learnings. There's been quite a bit of um, activity in relation to facilitating open knowledge in IATA. Uh, Boston shared this, um, Outputs, just the flavor of outputs delivered, and you will see that they are covering different aspects of facilitating access to open knowledge. There's a policy framework, the link is here. Uh, I'm sure all of us know. So there is a framework, but there's also staff and resources invested to operationalize that framework. Um, there is um, on the third point, uh, open data as part of the onboarding and offboarding of, of staff, of scientists. We know that the PAR process has now integrated the open data, open knowledge aspects, as well as project closer conditions. 
There is a data management plan template, which is also available online. The link is here. And of course, IIT is a strong collaborator in, in, uh, in the big data platform and hopefully also in the future initiatives dealing with the open data, big data and open knowledge and the one CGIR. Output thus far, um, again, you know, there's about 2,500 data sets. Um, there's support from the unit for open knowledge platforms for the scaling readiness platform. And the most interesting or a very interesting bullet, of course, is number four, where we see that uh, from, as of September, we had over a thousand visits directly to seek on IIT and then over 18,000 facilitated via via Guardian. This was zero in 2017. Um, Boson told me IIT, we are second. The second place in terms of data visibility in, uh, in Guardian. And he was very happy with that. And I was very happy too. But there is still another move we can make that's getting to position number one. Thanks to all colleagues who are engaged in verification and availing in open access data, open knowledge. And my last statement, open knowledge is OK. Thanks, um, uh, Ole Ami, and, and back to you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Bernard. That's very interesting. Open knowledge, it means OK. So once it's OK, let's know that it's open knowledge. Open knowledge, and it's OK. OK, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know if, if Dr. Masakagele can just give us a summary. I don't want to trouble Dr. Bernard to give us a summary of what he said in Strange, but you have a minute to do that if you want to. Désolé, je vais ouvrir mon micro. Oui, d'une façon très, très résumée, Monsieur Bernard, qui est le directeur de la recherche au niveau de l'ITA et le directeur de la région de l'Afrique centrale de l'ITA, faisait le point sur le principe d'accès facile ou accès facilité aux connaissances. Il a essayé de montrer l'importance de mettre en commun les données que nous avons, mais aussi l'information relative à ces données. Il a essayé de ressortir les six principes qu'il nous faudrait tenir en considération, ce qui est la visibilité de l'ITA, mais aussi la visibilité au niveau de nos partenaires, incluant les bailleurs de fonds, ce qui permet de nous donner une longueur d'onde. Il a essayé de démontrer aussi les, les différentes venues que nous avons pour permettre une visibilité de la science et aussi démontrer le progrès que nous avons fait à l'ITA depuis. Si on compare à 2017, notre visibilité était presque nulle. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes les, les deuxièmes au niveau de Guardian et ce qui pourrait être, nous motiver. Et c'est ça probablement le message clé de sa part, c'est de voir que tout le monde à l'ITA soit très motivé. Il est question de savoir pourquoi certains d'entre nous, nous savons que c'est important mais on hésite à le faire de temps en temps. Mais avec les résultats observés, il y a la note positive que très bientôt on pourrait être au premier niveau, au niveau mondial, ce qui accroît d'une manière significative la visibilité de l'ITA et de ses chercheurs, et au niveau national et au niveau de la communauté internationale, incluant les bailleurs de fonds. Et pour finir, on utilise le mot OK dans tout ce que nous disons et le partage facilité des connaissances devraient avoir la mention OK. Merci à résumer, c'est ça. Donc, briefly, that's what it is. Back to you. Thank you very much for that. We really appreciate that. Well, I must go back to my French class. So let's go on to Dr. Rangina Bhattacharji uh, for her presentation. I'll be sharing my screen with her for her. Brother. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for providing me this opportunity. Um, so, Layami, please, if you share. Okay. 
Sorry, I'm trying to speak. Okay. Okay, let's go now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you want to put it on um, powerful, like uh, presentation mode? Okay, um, so um, Dr. Bernard has already given uh, open knowledge or open access is okay. So I will just say why and how knowledge is opened. Uh, next. So um, why do we need open access? I'll just give you some uh, uh, insights into costs involved in publications. I'll start with the one uh, that is the readers. For most of the time, uh, the readers before open access came forth was quite costly because they had to find and read articles and then think of new research questions. Then if you move to the researchers and academics, it was still very costly because they had to study earlier research, which is literature review, conduct original research, analyze results and draw conclusions, write research papers. So it was costly or it is costly. Then if you come to the academic publishers, they have variable costs and it depends upon how they prepare the articles for publication in scholarly journals. Then it is, uh, if you come to the researchers or academics who review the articles and edit them, it is free for them. So they review and edit the articles and then accept or reject the articles for publication. Then there is also bibliogra bibliographic services, and these are costly article indexes because they have to maintain the databases, facilitate discovery of articles. And this, then the libraries, they have to provide subs subscription access and help. Next, please. So why do we need open access? I don't have to say much because Dr. Bernard has already spoken about it, but it's because research is tra traditionally disseminated by uh, journal articles or conference papers. And then access is inequitable and based on ability to pay before open access came. And research is not being disseminated as widely as it could be. So how did open access come about? The changes in scholarly publishing world, the changes in ownership and support system. The internet has actually emerged as one of the open access platform and the recognition of some academics and librarians that current model of scholarly publishing was not working. So how is open access achieved? There are two ways. One is called green, that is deposit in open access repository or via gold, which is publication in an open access journal. So changes in scholarly publishing system, there has been a huge growth in number of scholarly journals being published after open access became you know, a, a, a platform. The journals being published by societies or university departments to journals being now published by commercial publishers. Then move to electronic journals was a huge step forward for scholarly communication. And there is online databases providing free access to scholarly publications. Thank you. Next. So if you look at this graph or this photograph or picture, you'll see that the open access mandates are now rapidly changing. The models is that you know, sub, the, the subscription only is still there, but it's reducing. If you see from 2012 to 2016, there has been a huge reduction while there is increase in open access. Some people still follow the hybrid method. And if you see the hybrid method has not changed much. And the most important thing is there are about 996 open access policies and mandates are currently included in the registry of open access repository mandates and policies. So this actually everybody is trying to become open access. So this is increasing and we, have, we are almost up to 1000 open access policies. Thank you, next. 
So if you see the, this graph, you will find that from 1982 to 2009, there has been a huge re reduction in the library expenditure because from the time that you know, uh, open access has started from 2002 onwards. So there's a huge reduction. So that means the, the money that is being spent from projects or by the institutes or by the faculties on, on subscribing has reduced. Next. So in 2002, uh, the Budapest uh, Open Access Initiative was defined. It is, it is uh, the open access as the worldwide electronic distribution of the peer reviewed journal literature, which is completely free and unrestricted access to it by all scientists, scholars, teachers, students, and other curious minds. In 2003, a meeting of the biomedical community, they released something called Bethesda Statement on Open Access Publishing. And I will not go into the details, but it is based on two conditions. That means the authors and copyright holders or the grants, they should use free irrevocable worldwide perpetual right of access to and has a license to copy, use, distribute, transmit, and display the work publicly. The next one is a complete version of the work and all supplemental materials, including, including a copy of the permission, is in a suitable standard electronic format is deposited immediately upon initial publication in at least one online repository. So these are the requirements of open access publishing. Next. So what are the benefits of open access for institutes and the society? It increases visibility, usage and impact of research. It fuels innovation, allows faculty to retain control over their own publications. The public gets return on its investment. This, it promotes knowledge and the list just goes on. So what should be the strategies to achieve open access? The funders should mandate for open access repositories. The institutions should mandate for open access repositories. Society sponsored, sponsored open access journals, fee-based open access journals and fee-based open access art articles. Next. So if you look at this, this is a theoretical resources available to support open access world. And if you look at the one for, you know, the one for uh, uh, library subscription, I can't even read the amount. Yeah, but if you look at the open access ones, they are almost like four times less than the one which is based on uh, uh, library subscription. That is, that means open access is not only accessible to everybody, but it is also quite cheaper. Next. So I will go for some uh, frequency, uh, frequently asked questions around uh, uh, open access. Some people may ask, is open access a scheme to move the burden of subscription cost onto faculty or projects? It is no. Open access is an effort to make research publications as widely available as possible. Next. I have never paid to publish before. Why should I do so now? Because for open access, you have to pay quite high. Authors have historically actually paid for reprints, page charges, color plates, etc. In some cases, these would have been more expensive than the current open, action, uh, open access publication fee. So we may think that we have not paid earlier, but actually our institutes have project and our projects have paid or we have paid indirectly for having those uh, uh, articles. Next, will my institute help pay for publication costs? Yes, they should. In lieu of subscription costs, the institute or projects will have the resources available to support publication. For example, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, project, if you, are, if you have the MGF project, they do pay for your publication costs. Next, are open access journals peer reviewed to the same degree as more traditional publications? Yes, a journal's access policy does not determine its peer review policy. Most scholarly journals, whether open access or controlled access, they are rigorously peer reviewed by scholarly scientists. So they are both open and controlled journals that are not peer reviewed. Then there are a lot of bad open access journals out there. How do we distinguish the good journals from the bad ones? Open access is not a designation of quality. Open access journals should be judged by exactly the same criteria 
as any traditional publication. The caliber of the research published, the peer review process, the composition of the editorial board and staff, impact, impact factors or any other trusted metrics of quality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ranjana, for that presentation. Uh, you have touched a lot of areas where many are concerned about open access publications. And um, let me remind our listeners at this point that this program is being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube. And if you have any question for any of our panelists, please note your questions. We'll take all the questions at the end of all the presentations in order to save time. So let me invite Dr. Masaka Gaelic for his presentation now. Thank you very much. And, rem and remember, sir, that you can also, you'll also give us a summary of the French, of your interpretation in French. So I'm giving you 10 minutes. Okay, great. I guess uh, we just have to exit. I mean, you need to exit from uh, Ranjani's presentation, I guess, then I can be able to, to share mine. That's great, thank you. So then I can go to sharing my screen. And I think we should be there. I do hope you can see my screen. No? Do you see my screen or not? We can see your screen. Uh, thank you very much. You can't see so, yeah, so I briefly talk about the open knowledge and building structural equity. And thank you for the opportunity and good afternoon or and good, good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. I will focus on two aspects of the no, open knowledge and uh, building structural equity. I will focus mainly on participatory research how it can contribute to open knowledge, as well as the capacity building, using a few examples. So I will start with the IIT Central Africa Hub research strategy that we, was developed back in 2014, and try to see whether IIT has been thinking about open knowledge, and going back to really this participatory intervention for equity and so on. And we tried to see that we used to consider farmers, we used to consider, and we still consider other research organization, development partners, policy, and private sector. But what we have to do differently is to get them involved in all the stages. From the time we conceive, we, we design the research, including the implementation, the analysis of the data, and the publication of data is themselves which is not always the case. Sometimes we get them involved at a given stage, but we don't carry around them, them do across all the value chain of the research. So that is really one of the areas where we need to build on in terms of the structural equity and participatory research. And to get there is really trying to see how do we, do we work with the partners and build on existing knowledge. And that knowledge is our own knowledge as IIT, but it could also be the knowledge of the partners themselves. And that can include the public scientific publications and great literature in some of the cases, because sometimes we really think about what is in uh, the actual journals, but we don't know how much information is being hidden in great literature, as well as the local knowledge. Now, working with the same stakeholders, trying to analyze the knowledge gap, and this should include uh, a couple, a diversity of stakeholders being much actor, much disciplinary, and more importantly, to get it bottom up, not us as a, an institution going and try to say, to preach what we do, but trying to see what are the needs of the communities. So, research questions should be informed by inputs from the our stakeholders. From there, we can be able to identify the knowledge gaps and try to see how we 
we align those with the national priorities and so on. That also helps in terms of uh, sharing the knowledge. Then the second one is uh, to get the research we want to do, we need to mobilize human and financial resources. How do we work with these stakeholders? Also building the capacity in terms of fundraising, fundraising and so on. It's a knowledge itself. Being able to write a proposal and get it funded is very, very critical knowledge, which can address the issues of funding. Then uh, once it's done, let us make sure that there is an approach that we can adopt for co-managing of the research work. As I've already said, really from designing to almost publications. And the, importantly, we should keep in mind that when someone is bringing on board funds, another one is bringing on board knowledge, another one, the know-how, we should really give the same importance because it contributes a lot on transformative research for us to get where we want to get. And as I'm saying, we really need to see how do we do it? When we talk about participatory research, for everyone to gain the same level of information, how do we go about it? I have two photos to illustrate what I'm trying to say is, in some cases, we get farmers involved at a certain stage of our research. We explain what we have been doing, but they don't know what the other stages. So in terms of the knowledge gain, it's not that much. On the, that is mainly on the photo on the left. When you see the photo on the right, where farmers are already involved at the time of implementing, just applying the treatments themselves and assuming that they are carried along until the analysis and the publication of the result. In terms of learning, there is a huge difference, which will inform the adoption of the innovations and so on. Now, who should be our partners and so on, strategic partners? We all know it, there are many of them. And I try to refer to most of what we have been doing at IIT and why it is really a good source of a huge, huge amount of information and knowledge as we talk about open knowledge. I'm trying to illustrate the icon, I mean, the logos of two universities that we have been working with. This is just a sample. We have been working with thousands and thousands of those institutions, including national partners and so on. One, why this is very important. When you try to see the, scientific population of IIT coming from across the world, from all regions of the world, bringing all the know-how from all the regions to IIT, and now making sure that this information first centered at IIT is disseminated in, it, in the different countries where IIT is intervening to inform, to build the capacity of the young scientists from in the university systems like Kosovo Vision, then getting these messages to development partners like the Minister of Agriculture and so on, and the regulatory bodies to inform policy decisions is the best way we can be able to disseminate and share the knowledge. And what is, so what? The key is really that knowledge is being done for what? Our knowledge will be yield the result we are looking for the moment we can generate wealth from it how we get our partners involved and use the science and technologies and innovations we do to generate the wealth. Again, it's a kind of participatory approach in the capacity building. Here I'm referring to the Enable Youth Program that Bernard also mentioned in his statement, trying to build the capacity of the youth, depending on the typology. Here in Cameroon, for instance, we have been focusing on university graduates, but we can also focus on other category of youth. Translating the knowledge, the innovation, the technologies we develop at, I mean, developed by IIT and the partners of IIT to increase productivity and add value and including women and men in what we are doing, then we can make the difference we are looking for. So I have been asked to summarize what I'm saying in French. So what I'm going to do keeping my budget of 10 minutes. En bref, j'ai essayé de parler de cette question relative à l'accès facilité aux connaissances en tenant compte de promouvoir l'équité structurelle. Et j'ai utilisé des approches que nous pouvons considérer parmi tant d'autres, c'est le renforcement de capacité et la recherche participative. La recherche participative, c'est essentiellement 
comment on s'engage à impliquer nos parties prenantes à la première minute de la recherche, à partir de la conception jusqu'à la publication des résultats, pour être sûr qu'ils soient impliqués à tous les niveaux, ce qui peut faciliter l'adoption de ces connaissances. Et une meilleure façon de le faire, c'est d'analyser d'abord les parties prenantes qu'il nous, qu nous faut, travailler avec eux pour identifier les besoins par rapport aux connaissances actuelles, trouver les moyens pour le faire, essayer de regarder les priorités au niveau des pays pour pouvoir aligner tout ça ensemble et maintenant faire des efforts conjoints pour mobiliser les ressources. Et le plus important, s'assurer que la recherche n'est pas gérée uniquement par les chercheurs de l'ITA ou les chercheurs au niveau institutionnel, mais gérée par toutes les parties prenantes qui sont intéressées par cette recherche. C'est la meilleure façon de disséminer les connaissances pour faciliter l'adoption de ces connaissances. Et quelque chose que nous pouvons retenir, parfois certaines parties prenantes ne vont pas s'impliquer parce qu'ils disent qu'on n'a pas le financement, donc on ne peut pas le faire. Le plus important, c'est de comprendre que le financement, les connaissances et le savoir-faire ont tous une certaine importance qu'il nous faut retenir. Et amener tout cela sur la même table peut nous permettre de générer plus de connaissances, plus d'innovation, plus de technologies pour faire la différence. J'ai essayé de faire référence aux différentes institutions avec lesquelles L'ITA a travaillé depuis et pourquoi l'ITA travaille et pourquoi c'est important pour que l'ITA le fasse. On sait que l'ITA rassemble une bonne diversité de chercheurs qui viennent de partout au monde. Donc, ils amènent les connaissances d'un peu partout. Ces connaissances sont un peu centrées à l'ITA. Il faut trouver une bonne approche de disséminer ces connaissances. Et le travail que nous faisons avec les universités, avec les partenaires nationaux, ainsi de suite, incluant la réglementation, vont permettre que ces connaissances soient plus exploitées et plus disséminées. Et j'ai donné l'exemple du programme Enebouyou, comment on utilise les connaissances générées par l'ITA et ses partenaires pour améliorer la productivité, améliorer l'ajout de valeur, et ça en incluant les hommes et les femmes dans ce que nous faisons. Et je vous remercie pour votre attention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mr. Merci bien. Uh, we, we have answered some of the questions I would have loved to ask, but as you go, and maybe I'll have more questions for you. Let me remind our audience once again that this program is live streaming on YouTube and Facebook. And also, if you have questions, kindly note them and um, we'll, collect, we'll take all the questions at the end of all the presentations. So last but not the least, let me ask um, Mr. Bosnobile, the Institutional Data Manager, for his presentation. Am I audible? Okay. Welcome, everybody. I uh, let me some behalf of the data management unit responsible for open access society. I want to say welcome to everybody once again. My director, then, whom we report to, Bernard, has welcomed us, has given a speech, and it's an opportunity for us to do a form of awareness on open access at ITA. On the theme, I'll be focusing more on the infrastructure aspect of the equity. It's talking about how we open knowledge and build the structural equity. So you look at the open data, the open source, the open information, the open knowledge, that is the working of all these things that we are talking about. We are focusing on my side on the equity, I mean, on the infrastructure change. This presentation focuses more on the technical infrastructure for opening knowledge and the infrastructure that will support the structural equity. So uh, while I look at what we have been given, I also want to add to it that knowledge could be defined as facts. It's information, 
that is based on facts and skills acquired through experience or education, a theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. That's the knowledge. Another person sees that awareness or familiarity gained by experience of a fact or situation. To another person, he says, you are giving me the fact. Fact is talking about valid data. So in summary, open knowledge requires the application of data for renewed insight. So based on what I just explained now, I want to say that open knowledge requires definite and deliberate action that supports the building block of knowledge, and that is data. Without valid data, we can take in wrong knowledge. And that is where we have what is called the fake news and the valid news. You know, in the last year's election, that's popular what became the talk of the town, fake news. That means that any knowledge taken from that unvalidated data and being acquired is not a true knowledge. But true knowledge that's meant for opening comes from valid data. And here we have many stakeholders, which include, we have our scientists, and that's why we have somebody like, and people like Dr. Ranjana, Dr. Kageli, Dr. Bernard, and a host of scientists here. I can see Dr. Lena Tripathi there, and Alejandro. A lot of people are here that are scientists. We have the students, the higher staff, they are also on board here. We have the private sectors, the public sector, and the government, they make use of this data, not for profit organizations, and our funders that give us this money, they have. And, um, apart from that, we have many other users. For us to be able to open data properly, it is good both the provider of the data and the user, the consumer, goes beyond just having fair data. It is important that we attribute our data or publication to the appropriate attribution. For instance, fair data is no longer a new slang in, in the circles of researchers because everybody knows that, oh, I should produce what is fair. My publication should have valid data before it could be accepted. However, if we mention opening up the knowledge, we need to have the understanding of, this, of the kind of license that should go with our data, knowledge, publication, whatever you want to make open. There, is, there could be publications that you put on, on blogs that does not have any license. Anybody can see it and use it. But when you try to put it in a verified and trusted repository, you can use licenses like CC BY, which means that everybody can use your data. They can modify it, but they must attribute it that this is the creator of the data. Another common one is the CC BY SA. That is, you need to attribute, share alike. Everybody can use it, can publish it, must give you attribution, can use it for commercial, but the person has no right to change the license. When it goes beyond this, every other one is not really open again. You could be fair, but not open. So you need to ensure that when you are putting your data outside there, or you are putting your publication outside there, ensure that you have the appropriate license go by it. If not so, your open knowledge you may not have credit for what you are doing. So we need to do it in a proper way. I say beyond fear data. Let's open that fear itself. When we talk about fear in data or knowledge, you are saying that the data, the publication should be findable. How do you do that one? You put it in the trusted location and must have what is called DOI, Digital Object Identifier, a permanent ID. It must be accessible. It must be interoperable and it should be usable. So you deposit the data and publications in trusted repository with no technological restriction to the data. And that is only when it is open. When it requires someone to log in, it is fair, but it's not absolutely open. It's just a fair data. So you give it up completely and say, okay, use my data, but ensure you give me credit back to what you are using. And such kind of data or information must comply with standard ontology, which enhances open knowledge. For instance, in agronomy, in one CG, we are having agroho. 
for Coco Soil, we are developing the standard ontology. I'm part of the team developing the standard ontology that will be used for Coco Soil. We have for social economy, we have CHO, we have so many for different thematic areas. So if your data is not conforming to the global standard, you may find out that yes, you open it, but this use, its adaptability may not be well well accepted as you are expecting. Let me put it that way. Another one is that you should encourage cross-border collaboration, which promotes knowledge to look beyond just IIT. We should look at our partners, which are we doing here, or we can do more. Another thing that has been neglected in research world is the indigenous data and knowledge. For instance, when we are looking at a country like, I mean, Australia, there are some people that settled down in this country, in this country before people come in as a result of migration. The same thing in Africa too. When we are dealing with locals, we need to be sensitive with their data. How do you open their knowledge? Do we protect their identity? We need to understand their fears when we are doing research with them. So when we are opening up their, I mean, their information to the public, we need to take care of their identity too to take care of I mean, personally identifiable information, ethical concerns, we need to build into whatever we are sharing. So we are not just being fair, we are opening it and we are being fair at the same time. That is, you respect those that should be respected in terms of their privacy, and then we can open the data. Data creators should be invited as collaborators by data users in new projects, so that we encourage them to create more trusted data and do not community should fund more of open access data. And finally, I have this structure that talks about what we have at IITA. In IIT here, we are we used to have I mean, RDBMS platform that is meant for putting data. You can just put your any data into it, whether it is consistent or inconsistent. We have AI gun that is used for, as a library platform for storing books. And then we have the hint magic for li managing library management, like you want to borrow books, you want to submit it back, I mean, return it back, we have it in place. Those are good. And then they have means of identifying those books or data. But today they cannot fit into today. IITA is trying to transition to the next gen. We are following other institutions like Harvard, like the, I mean, I mean, I mean Queen's universities and some universities in Europe, which are already moved into platforms like Secan, Dataverse, GeoNode, GeneSpace, DSpace, ResourceSpace. These platforms, they are called next generation repositories. They are the infrastructure that will support whatever we are building in terms of equity to be made open to the public. And when we have this platform, they needed to be integrated with data management tool that will enhance the research output to be well integrated. And I know in one CG, we have what is called the CG lab, which is a tool that's being used to integrate with other repositories. It is still work in progress. We are not yet there. And finally, I want to say we are here because you are there. And as IITA, we are only here because we have stakeholders outside there. We can only be open when our outside communities sees us as acceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilson, for that presentation. I was about signaling you to, to stop. <laughs> that time is up. Well, thank you for that presentation. We don't want to take too much of our time. Uh, from our audience, I haven't seen any question. So if you have questions, please, this is a time for you to ask. While we are waiting for questions from our audience, I want to ask um, Dr. Kagele, you mentioned something about participatory, uh, how are you? youths are participating in, to ensure open knowledge and active participation from consumers of knowledge. Can you please elaborate more on that? Yes, thank you very much. So the key is, uh, as we said, I will bid on what Bernard just said initially that in Guardian, by 2017, we were not there, but now we talk about uh, tens of thousands of uh, visibility of IIT. So it's the same thing. We really have to improve in the area of participatory research. The way we have been doing it in the past, 
and uh, my comment is based on my recent interventions into discussions related to living labs. And we realized that the idea behind of, of all of it is to make sure that from the design of the research to the publication of the results, so which includes implementation, analysis, and so on, the users of the stakeholders are involved. So the consumers of the knowledge are involved. So if you are working with farmers, people will defer, for example, of farmer-centered research, means the farmers are involved in co-managing most of the research trials we have, which is not necessarily the traditional way of uh, doing business in our I mean, uh, history, but it's, I think there is, the current trend is moving towards that. And how to do it is really a good mapping of the key stakeholders interested by the area of research. It's not everyone that we meet, but who are the really actors? If we look, for example, at the value chain and try to see who are the value chain actors and how do we bring them on board on the research we want to do, being breeding, being integrated soil fertility management, being integrated pest management, I mean, the social science and so on. So that's the really difference, getting them involved in all stages of the research. Yeah, thank you very much for that um, clear explanation. We need to get them involved right from the beginning of the research. Um, there's a question here from Dr. Komi, and I would like to push this question to Dr. Ranjana. She mentioned something about it in her presentation, so that's why I'm pushing the question to her so that she can explain more. It says some open access journal request quite high amounts of, for publication. For projects where no clear budget exists, those IIT library or other departments have resources available to encourage staff to publish in open access journals. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I don't think IITA library uh, or any other department have those resources. You know, um, majority of the times it is better that you request your donor if they can have some uh, uh, funds uh, saved for publications. Majority, like for, for like in RTB, CRPRTB, we have funds for for publication for BNGF funded. There will be publication, but in cases where you do not have any uh, projects that will uh, support your publication cost. I think the best way to go forward is, you know, ask for contributions from all the co-authors and see if the co-authors have any project that will support the publication cost. Yes, as open access is becoming, uh, uh, you know, an important aspect, the cost of publication is also going high. That's a fact. But I don't know if IITA has any uh, policy over... Uh, uh, you know, having some funds uh, for, for such publications, I don't know about that. And I don't think it is there. Thank you. Thank you for that. You have given us one solution at least. Let all co-authors contribute towards the publication. May I please ask uh, Dr. Kagele Merso for a brief interpretation of what uh, uh, Dr. Rangela's last comment and he, your comment before then, please. Yeah, that's great. So I will start with the comment of uh, Dr. Ranjana in terms of, je uh, m'excuse, celle of l'anglais parfois nous prend et on oublie. Je vais commencer à traduire ce que Madame Ranjana a dit par rapport à aux publications qui sont facilitées d'accès. Comme le docteur Komi posait la question de savoir pourquoi c'est un journal chargé beaucoup d'argent et comment on peut s'en sortir. Et un point, c'est que Parfois, certains bailleurs de fonds, comme Bill Gates, pour ceux qui le savent, qui ont travaillé sur les projets, vont faciliter les publications. L'autre chose, c'est que parfois, il y a des projets qui ont déjà passé à l'argent pour la publication. Mais le plus important, quand vous avez plusieurs auteurs qui sont impliqués dans la publication, ça serait très utile de partager les coûts. Disons ça coûte 3 000 dollars et vous êtes 10, 10 personnes à, à avoir partagé l'article, pourquoi ne pas partager pour que ça devienne 300 dollars par auteur? Donc ça, brièvement, c'est ce que Ranjana a dit. Et ce que je disais tout à l'heure par 
la recherche participative, c'est que l'IT a toujours engagé ses partenaires dans ses travaux, mais il y a toujours lieu d'améliorer quelque chose. C'est maintenant comment vraiment faire la recherche en tenant compte d'une bonne analyse des parties prenantes qui sont affectées ou intéressées par cette recherche et les impliquer depuis la conception jusqu'à la livraison de la recherche. Je vous dirais que c'est facile à dire, mais parfois compliqué. Mais l'une des choses, c'est de savoir qui sont ces parties prenantes et comment elles peuvent contribuer à la gestion ou au management de cette recherche que nous faisons ensemble. Donc, en quelque sorte, on ne fait pas la recherche pour les parties prenantes, mais on fait la recherche pour et avec les parties prenantes. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Kagel. Uh, time is far spent. Uh, we have a, a, uh, a suggestion from Komi. We have noted that. I'm sure Boston will be glad to share a slide that explains the different types of licenses. And I have the final question here for Boston, please. And um, the question is, how can open access enhance knowledge management in one or two sentences? Thank you. Okay, although that the, the, our time is fast spent, open knowledge management is simply the management of the output of open access. And you can't manage any knowledge that is, you, you can manage knowledge that's available, but the knowledge that you have that is to be managed when it is open is more and to enhance their diversity in terms of the fields of, that you are viewing into. The person that actually asks the question is a specialist in that area. So I, I expect that he already has an answer. The only answer I would just say is that the open knowledge that you have increased the workload of knowledge management. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for all your contributions, the presentations, and your participations for all who have sent in comments and um, appreciating the team. We also appreciate you. And again, I reiterate for Komi's suggestion that person prepares slides to explain the type, each type of license that has been noted and will be taken care of. So once again, I want to thank our panel of discussants this afternoon, especially I want to thank Dr. Kagele for taking up an assignment. We uh, we, 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 we stand on the, on the good rapport you have and the support you have always given this team. And that is why we can come to you with this kind of request. And we want to thank you for accepting our request and granting us that uh, interpretation at no cost, open access indeed. I want to thank Dr. Ranjana Bhattacharji. You have been a supporter of the team and uh, an open access uh, supporter and influencer and we cannot thank you enough for all you do for the team and for your support we hope that anytime we call upon you you'll be eager to heed our call and to all who are participating in this webinar online thank you for sparing time i hope you have gained one or two things and to the entire data management team i say thank you for your support and for all the work you put in to make sure that open access is known to all and sundry within IIT and even beyond. Remember, open knowledge is okay. Thank you, everyone. And we have really enjoyed your presence. Thank you. Great. I'd appreciate it and enjoy your day and bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Open knowledge is okay. Open Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>